Okay, so today we are going to talk about uh, stochastic optimization. That's the topic. So life is not about certainty, life is about uncertainty. So one way to model uncertainty is to put a probabilistic structure put a probabilistic structure on the uncertainty and then try and evaluate or try and optimize variables for that particular distribution. So how many of you have taken uh, probability type classes in your undergrad or grad program? How many of you have not taken any probability class whatsoever? Okay. Okay. So. I want to motivate the stochastic optimization by a few problems. So consider, uh, consider the following problem. How does, so Kroger is a big uh, company. It has to stock all its shelves. How do they know how many items to put on each shelf? Or how many items of one type to put on each shelf every day? Okay, so how many of you are going to Kroger today? No one? <laughs> okay, three or four people. Uh, are you, how many of you are going tomorrow? How many of you are going one week later? Right, okay, <laughs> a few. There's still some determinism. How many of you are going one month later? Exactly a month from now. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so the issue is that you yourself don't know when you are going to buy stuff from Kroger next right? Um, or at least many of you wouldn't know whether you are going to go today or tomorrow or day after tomorrow or what time of the day you will be going. There is an uncertainty from your side. And imagine that there are so many people doing so many uncertain things and Kroger has to make sure that the material is available when you go and buy it. So there is some amount of optimization that Kroger has to do. If it puts too many things on the shelf and you don't go and buy it, then the shelf uh, and then the item could go, could rot or, I mean, if it is food item, it could rot or it could expire or uh, uh, it could be just uh, occupying the shelf space which, which could have been used for some other item. Uh, so that's one problem. The other problem is if it has too few items and a lot of you go to Kroger, then suddenly there is a trouble that you are not able to get the items that you want and that's a bad outcome for you and you will be uh, you will decide that you will not go to Kroger because the items are always out of stock whenever you go there. Okay, so, so, how do you, so if you are a Kroger, if you are an owner of a Kroger store, how are you going to decide how many items to put on shelf, how many breads to put on shelf or how many milk to put on shelf and things like that? What would your first line of approach would be. So it's an optimization problem. There is a trade-off that needs to be made. So what's your? Like look at the history of what's been bought. Look at the history, okay. And, and see, what kind of trends there are. see what kind of trends there are, and then what do you do? Uh, let's say on every Friday, if, you, if I look at the history of last 52 weeks, on every Friday, um, the, on some Fridays there were 10 bottles of milk sold, and on some Fridays there were 20 bottles of milk sold. How are you going to decide how many bottles of milk will you put? Would you put 20? Would you put 25? Take some kind of average. Or average. Take some kind of average, yeah. You have some thoughts? Oh, um, you can model it as some sort of distribution and try to count that for like right. certain coverage. Right, so that's similar to taking an average over the past one year of um, demand. So that's exactly the idea of stochastic optimization, where you have omega, which is the set of uncertainties. So 10 bottles of milk, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up to 20. So in the case of milk example that we just talked about, omega is 10, 11, 12, and then 20, okay? Then we have, so this is uh, the set of all uncertainties that we have seen. So usually you have to look at historical data 
to figure out what are the set of uncertainties in your optimization problem. Uh, so that's m omega. Then you have A, which is a subset of omega, and it's called event. So all subsets of omega are known as events. Then you have a probability, which is a map that maps all the subsets of the set omega to a number between 0 and 1. So 2 raised to omega is power subset. Power set of omega. Okay. So there are many examples of P. So uniform distribution, which means that every possible uncertainty can has equal chance of happening. And uh, So let's 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 look at what uniform distribution would do. So you have 10, 11, 12, 20, and a uniform distribution would put equal weight to each of these possibilities. So you look at the historical data, you look at how many times people bought 10 milk, how many Fridays people bought 10 milk, and how many Fridays people bought 11 milk, and so on. And you identified that uh, there is no favorite number. So um, four Fridays people bought 10 milk, four Fridays people bought 11 milk, four, private, four Fridays people bought 12 milk cartons, and so on, all the way up to 20. So that's why you have a uniform distribution. But of course, you could have non-uniform distribution. Where you could have distributions that look like this. So you have a lot of people. Uh, in a lot of instances, you have 10 bottles of milk sold. In a lot of instances, you have 20 bottles of milk sold. But other instances happen less frequently. So that's a non-uniform distribution. OK? Now that function p satisfies certain properties. So let's see what the most crucial property of p is. So p satisfies additivity property, which means that if A1 intersection A2 is null set, then probability of A1 union A2 is probability of A1 plus probability of A2. Okay. In fact, this holds for countable unions as well. Okay. So this is the additivity property of probability distribution. So let's go back to this example. So we have 11 items. So this weight is 1 over 11. Let me pick A to be equal to 10 comma 11 comma 12 what would the probability of a event a b any thoughts so 10 intersection 11 is a null set 11 intersection 12 is null set 10 intersection 12 is null set so these are all uh, mutually exclusive events and so this is probability of 10 plus probability of 11 
plus probability of 12 and this is 3 over 11 because each of these probabilities are is equal to 1 over 11. Uh, yes. This property is only valid for uniform distribution. No, this property is valid for any probability distribution function. Okay. So, let's look at the other distribution I was drawing. So, let's say 10 was 1 over or 3 over 11. 11 was 1 over 22, 12 was 1 over 22. Then the probability of 10, 11, 12 is 3 over 11 plus 1 over 22 plus 1 over 22. What does this add up to? 4 over 11. Okay, so it's true for any probability distribution, not just the uniform distribution. Okay. The other uh, property that P satisfies is P of null set is equal to zero. So if there is no event or the event is empty, then the probability of that event happening is zero. Okay. What are the other properties of probability? Let me think. So countably additivity property and then null set property. Sum of all the oh, P of omega is equal to one. And what's the something that you were saying? That's, that's yeah, that's the additivity property, right? No, oh, some, okay, yeah. So P of omega has to be equal to one, so the total uh, the total set of uncertainty has to have probability 1. Okay. Now that we have introduced the probability, you can define the expectation of a function, so f. So let's say f is a function from omega to r, then expected value of f of omega is summation f of omega, p of omega, omega in capital omega. So this is the definition of expectation. This is known as expectation. Expectation or mean. Yes. Uh, actually, there is one more rule missing, which is probability of any event is greater than equal to zero. Yeah, but that is by construction, right? This is in zero to one. Yeah, so it has to be between zero and one. It can't be. Okay. So now that we know about the expectation, uh, this explains what the initial idea of some of your friends was that. I'm going to look at how many milk cartons are sold every Friday, and then I'm going to use the past data to come up with the distribution, the probability distribution over the milk cartons, and I'm going to use some sort of expectation or averaging to identify or to compute how many milk cartons I should put on every Friday on the shelf. Okay, and this is exactly the way uh, expectation is computed. So f is any function of the set of uncertainties to r. You take the expectation, which means you add, add up the function evaluated at that uncertain point multiplied by the probability weighting at that particular point, and then you sum it up over all possible uncertainty. Now this is a situation where omega, which is a set of uncertainties, is a discrete set. You could have situations where omega is actually a continuum. So uh, closed interval 10 to 20, 
And in that case, you could have uh, you could have very complicated measures, but we are going to consider measures which have distribution. Uh, so I'm going to consider that situation because it's much easier to deal with uh, in comparison to more general situations. So omega is, let's say, 10 to 20. I define a distribution function. I've used f already. What should I use? g. Let me use g is used as a cost function. What should I use? Any suggestion what should I use for distribution function, density function? <laughs> psi. psi, okay, good. <laughs> psi. Okay, psi is a function from omega to zero infinity. And the distribution function should satisfy integral of psi x dx or psi of omega d omega over the entire omega should be equal to one. In fact, the probability of A is given by integral over A psi of omega d omega. And the expected value of f of omega, no. Yeah, expected value of f of omega is given by integral f of omega psi omega d omega. And this integral is over all, over the entire set of uncertainty omega. Any questions so far? So yeah, so this is a discrete distribution, this is a continuous distribution. Okay, and you can have more general distribution which uses combination of discrete and continuous distributions, but we are not going to consider it in this class. Okay. But the, whatever theory we talk about, it holds for all general distributions. Any questions so far? No. Okay. So let's now move on to optimization. The idea in optimization, the stochastic optimization in particular, is to have a function, I've used f, yeah. So I have a set x, which is a subset of Rn. I have a function from x cross omega to R. And I want to minimize expected value of f of x comma omega. The expectation is with respect to omega, and I want to minimize it over all x and x, capital X. Okay, so this is the uh, underlying theory or the basic problem of stochastic optimization. Okay, questions? Okay, so the most interesting stuff that happens in stochastic optimization is when you have a dynamic optimization problem. So this x would be a set of decisions that you need to make over time. Omega is the set of uncertainty that would happen over a period of time. And you want to minimize some objective function, based, which is a function of your decisions and the uncertainty that would play out in the future. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk about dynamic programming uh, for uh, under uncertainty. Okay, and this is, uh, and then in the next class, I'm going to introduce news vendor problem, which is a, a specific instance of a dynamic program, dynamic problem with uncertainty. So.
So in dynamic programming or The idea is I have my state transition function xt plus 1 is equal to ft of xt ut wt and now xt is the state, ut is the action, wt is the uncertainty that affects the state. And then I want to minimize J of U, which is G capital T X T plus summation G T of X T comma U T, T equals zero to T minus one. And I want to minimize it over the entire sequence of actions U. Oh, there has to be an expectation. Okay, so let's look at specific examples and we have covered so many examples in the class. So um, if you're driving a car, XT is the state of your current ve your vehicle at this point of time, so that's your speed, position, GPS coordinates, uh, which lane you are in, and so on. UT is your action, which is usually steering and braking, an acceleration command, and WT is what other people around you are doing, okay? And so, of course, if, you, if you're driving on a free road and a person comes in front of you, so that's your WT, person comes in front of you, then the heading distance, which is the distance between you and the vehicle in front, reduces, and your new, new distance would be much smaller than the original distance you had uh, because of the uncertainty that is imposed by other people who are driving around you. In the store example, XT is your current inventory, UT is the number of things you have ordered. So if you're a Kroger manager, XT is the number of milk cartons currently on the shelf, UT is the number of milk cartons you will put on the shelf, WT, is the number of customers buying the carton by the end of the day. And so you have a sum total of cost and you want to minimize this cost uh, over a sufficiently long horizon GT. Now when you are in a dynamic setting, a lot of things can happen. So you want to minimize the total cost, but in some situations, you may want to minimize what is known as regret, okay? What is, uh, what, do you, what do you think is regret? Any thoughts? What would you term as regret? So do you regret something in life? No? Leftover maybe. Leftover, okay. So he defines regret as leftover. What is regret? Do you know what regret is? Um, something you could achieve, but you didn't. Something you could achieve, okay, so that's uh, slightly more mathematical. So something you could achieve, achieve, but you didn't. So why, why couldn't you achieve why couldn't you achieve whatever you wanted to achieve? Um, because, the randomness in the system. because of randomness, okay. Because of randomness in the system. So okay, so let us let me ask you this question. How many of you regret coming to this class? EC 5759 class. <laughs> no one? Wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's define regret.
So regret is uh, something you could achieve if you had known the uncertainty. So let me not write it as something you could achieve, but optimal cost if I knew the uncertainty or uncertain variables minus optimal cost when I don't. Okay? And I want to pause here for a moment and let you uh, let you uh, think about this concept. So regret is optimal cost if I knew the uncertain variable. So before you sign up for a class, you want to know how many homeworks it will have, how many assignment, how many exams it will have, what kind of project you will have to do, and things like that. So that's your, and then you want to make sure that you minimize your optimal cost, which uh, if, you are, if your cost is to learn more and more, so that's a reward, right? So if your cost is to learn as much as possible, you would potentially uh, sign up for difficult courses. If your cost is to get the degree, or that's, that's what your terminal cost comprises of getting a degree, you will probably go for easier courses, right? Or a combination of the two. So that's the optimal cost if you knew the uncertain variable, if you knew exactly how the course is going to be for, for your specific background. And then you subtract from that the optimal co cost when you actually don't know how easy or difficult that course is going to be for you. So of course, this is a 5759 class. It's a 5000 level class. For some people, this class was very easy. For some people, this class was very difficult, right? And so the difference between that if you, had, if you had known it before, you may not have taken this class, but because you did not know about how much effort it's going to take, you took this class. So the difference between these two uh, costs or optimal cost is known as regret. And so in dynamic optimization, when you're doing dynamic, so regret only appears when you're doing, when you have dynamics in the system. It wouldn't appear if, there, if, if it was a static problem. So in this static optimization problem, you will never have regret. But when you have dynamics, then the regret appears. Okay, so most of the regret you will ever have in life is because life is a dynamic process, it's not a static process. I wish it was. Okay. Okay, so. So remember that policy is a function from xt to ut, from the state to action. And so the regret is of the policy gamma is defined as gt of xt plus summation xt comma ut or gamma t xt i need to do a minimization here so let me do min u of j u omega let me define omega as W0 to W capital T minus 1. So minimum uh, cost when I had known what the uncertainty is minus J of gamma, which is the cost achieved using my current policy, the policy that I've devised, the cost achieved at that particular policy. And then I have to sub take the expectation over this entire uh, random variable. And in many cases, you want to minimize the regret. So you want to come up with a policy that makes use of the information you are getting in order to minimize this total cost. Okay? So whenever you are in a dynamic 
programming with uncertainty, you could have either this situation where you know the underlying statistics of the random variable and you just want to minimize the cost, or alternatively, you want to minimize the regret. And human decision makers are typically regret minimizers. So if you're creating a system for humans, you want to incorporate some notion of regret within the optimization. Of course, if you are you know, sending a rocket to space, it's not a human decision maker system, so you might want to use the usual minimization approach. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, you define the regret as the optimal cost and the uncertainty uh, variable. So right. By saying you knew the uncertainty variable, you knew the exactly what it was instead of the distribution of it. Uh, so, uh, so the knowledge could be at various levels. So you may know the distribution, or you may have distributions over distributions. Uh, but the regret is defined more generally where you dip. So if you know the distribution, and that's the, knowledge you, that's the only knowledge you need to compute the expected value, then you can either do this or you can do this. But in many cases, the omega itself is not known, the distribution itself is not known. Then you cannot use this approach. You can only use this approach. Okay. Uh, typically, regret optimization is useful where the distribution over omega is not known, number one, or you know the distribution, or you, you know that the distribution comes from a specific class, but you don't know which distribution that is. Okay. So for instance, in the case of the milk carton example, uh, you know that the omega would be uniform plus some small error to the uniform distribution, but it won't be a completely different distribution. So that's also a case where regret minimization would be useful. If you know the distribution precisely, and there is no uncertainty about distribution, and this, is, this doesn't happen ever in life, but if that is the situation, you can just do the regular minimization. You don't have to go through the regret optimization problem. But most of the times, you will have some uncertainty around the distribution, and then regret optimization becomes useful. Yeah. Uh, in the second question, uh, how do you calculate the expectation when you don't know the distribution? Yeah, you need the distribution. Ah, so I'm going to come to this in a, in a few. So let's consider a simple problem. Uh, Let's consider a simple problem. You have a website, and you display an advertisement on the website. Every time a person clicks on the advertisement, you get $1. And if nobody clicks on the advertisement, you get $0. Every day, 100,000 people come on that website. So you can potentially earn $100,000, or you could earn $0. Now, the, so you know that the distribution is such that the mean value lies between these two values but you don't exactly know what that mean value would be. So that's a situation where uh, the expected value of the earnings would be between 0 and 10 raised to 5. OK? So you don't know the distribution, but you know the mean has to lie in certain range. OK? So that's the situation where regret minimization becomes useful. So as you get more and more data, which is what most of the people do nowadays, as you get more and more data, you can update the, based on the new information, you can update your policy uh, gamma uh, of t. I'm trying to think, uh, besides advertisement, where, where else people have used the regret minimization? Most of the examples that I can think of is uh, related to advertising example. But I have seen a lot of papers. Oh, regret is also useful in, so you are in a new situation, new city, and you don't know what the channel states are. So a lot of people work on wireless systems. You don't know what the channel states are in that particular city. So you have to start understanding 
the statistics of every channel. And then based on that, you communicate or you come up with a communication strategy. So that's also another situation where regret has been used in the past. Uh, the dynamic programming, of course, is much more general because this has been used for time immemorial. Regret is something that, uh, that was defined long time back, I think in 60s and 70s, but it has received much attention recently because it explicitly uses the data that you have received so far to update your policies and thereby increase your, improve your performance based on the current data that you have received. Yes? Uh, let me take this problem when I consider a specific example in a few. Uh, maybe, maybe on uh, after Thanksgiving. That's when I'll come to the regret minimization. Um, we'll see a situation of multi-arm bandit where you can actually do the expectation expectation because. In that situation, all you need to know is uh, the expected value of the earnings, but you don't quite need to know the precise distribution. Okay. Any other question? So this J? Oh, so. No, this, ca this cannot be a minimization because uh, you can only get gamma star if you solve problems like this, but you're not necessarily solving problems like this. Okay? Uh, note that this gamma depends on the omega that is evolving over the past, the, the, the set of omegas that you have seen in the past. Okay? So that's why this expectation is needed. And again, when I get to multi-arm bandit, you will see how this uh, framework becomes useful. So if we think of the gamma in that as like the actions you actually took. Yes. You as actions, or like what you have seen the past. You should have took or taken. So this is what actions you would have taken if you had known the uncertainty exactly. This is the set of actions that you have taken under the evolving uncertainty situation. So this was the uncertainty that you had not seen, but of course at every point of time you're receiving new data and based on that new data you're updating your strategy. So this gamma depends on omega, but only on omega that you have seen so far, not the future omega that you have not seen. Okay, so this is a, a, a causal policy and then you want to minimize the total expectation. Okay. There's another form of uh, Minimization you can do, which is known as risk sensitive. Where you want to minimize E raised to GT plus summation of GT t equals 1 to t minus 1. And this is minimization over u or gamma, depending upon whether you're looking for open loop or closed loop control. And this is known as risk sensitive optimization. What's the difference between risk sensitive and this problem? So I just added an exponential in the expectation, and here it's just the regular expectation. Any thoughts? So in risk, risk sensitive, you are penalizing higher cost actions much more than you were penalizing it here, okay? So you pick an action that is very costly, but the event of, the probability of that event happening is very small. This is very small. But in this case, the, because that action is a costly action, it gets overblown because of the E raised to U term, the E raised to GT term, okay? So the costly, ex, costly actions 
are magnified in the risk sensitive control. Okay, so you always want to be very, very conservative. You act conservatively. when you uh, want to be sensitive to any risk that you might foresee. So if you are a generator, which is providing crucial energy needs for a large number of households, you want to be risk sensitive. So even if it costs you more to uh, run your plant, it's completely fine because you want to act conserv conservatively, you don't want to act according to the usual expectation. So typically when you are doing risk sensitive optimization, your overall cost may go up because now you are taking actions that are more conservative. But at the same time, you minimize events that have very high cost. Okay, so blackouts for instance. Let me give you an example where risk sensitivity is actually useful. So in the energy markets, let's say the current demand is 40 gigawatt for a state or for a group of states. The actual production or the, the amount of actual production is roughly of the order of 45 gigawatt. Not this, so this is not the actual production, but this is the production that one could reach within a matter of a few seconds, okay? So why is that? Let's say in this 40 gigawatt, there may be a thousand generators producing this 40 gigawatt and three or four generators uh, shut down because of some event, some very rare event, some problem that happened with the generator. Then some other power plants have to go up and running immediately in order to meet the demand, in order to prevent a blackout. And in order to, so you cannot just start a generator, okay? So these are very big generators. They have to be running at all the times in order to ramp up their production. If, you, if it is shut down, you cannot just immediately start in and start producing electricity. So therefore, a lot of these power plants are just running at their lowest uh, production level, just so that they can go all the way up to full production level if a generator goes out of service at any point of time. Now, keeping a generator up and running at their lowest production point is actually very inefficient from an economics perspective, okay? And the Possibility of blackout is very, very small. Possibility of a generator failing is small, but you still have to pay the additional cost of keeping the generators up and running at their lowest production point, because if that low probability event happens and that low probability event is a generator failing, if that happens, uh, you want to make sure that all the people are served and there is no event of blackout. So that's an outcome of a risk sensitive optimization. So costly action, which is a blackout, are magnified, and therefore you act conservatively, which means keeping some generators on at their lowest production uh, level, just so that you can use them if a situation arises. Okay? So these are the three broad classes of problems that you study under dynamic programming with uncertainty. So you could have uh, regular minimization, which is something that people have been doing since 1960s. So I don't know if you pick up any paper, it is most likely covering this problem. Uh, some problems, particularly where the distribution is evolving, the distribution of the underlying distribution, uh, sorry, underlying randomness is evolving. You use regret minimization because your policy could make use of the information that you're generating through the process and update itself. And the third class of problems is risk sensitive where you try to act conservatively in order to avoid uh, costly situations. So in today's class and the next class, I'm going to talk about the, this problem uh, the next class is on Monday. How many of you are going to be here on Monday? Okay, good. So I'll be here on Monday too. Uh, <laughs> because a lot of people told me they are flying, doing this and that and all that stuff. And I was like, I don't know if there are only going to be five people in the class or we'll have more than five people. Uh, anyway, so it looks like a lot of people will be here. So that's good. So I'm going to talk about this uh, optimization on Monday. Well, 
dynamic programming algorithm today, news vendors problem on Monday. And then I'm going to talk about the regret minimization after Thanksgiving. And then uh, we're not going to talk about the risk sensitive part, but I'm going to talk about the regret minimization. And then we will cover it in much more detail in the reinforcement learning class that I'll be teaching next semester, which I know many of you have registered for it. Okay. So DP for um, expected cost. Okay. So V of T of X of T is defined in the usual fashion. So that's G of T, the terminal cost at X of T. Now when I get to V of T minus one, I want to minimize U of T minus one, minimize over U of T minus one of Okay. So at t minus one, I know the current state. I know the action that I'm planning to pick. Okay, so that's what I'm minimizing over. So we have the current state, which I know. We have the action that I'm going to take. What about w t minus one? That's the uncertainty. That's the number of customers coming to the store. And I don't quite know at the beginning of the time, how many people are going to arrive at the store today. So in the morning, I don't know how many people will come and buy milk cartons today. So what you want to do is take the expectation over all possible randomness that you're going to see today. Okay. Okay, that's the only difference. So in the usual DP, we did not have this uncertainty and we didn't need to take the expectation. But when you have DP with uncertainty, then you want to take the expectation of the future cost that you are going to see. So this is expectation or mean of cost to go mean of the future cost to go. Okay. Similarly, you define gamma star of t minus one as the argument of the same thing. Okay, more generally, V of t of xt is min over ut of gt plus expected value of vt plus one composition ft and then similarly, gamma star t of xt is argmin of ut. Of the same thing.
Any questions so far? Okay, so whenever I see uncertainty that I have not seen so far, I just take the expectation. And so I take the expectation of the future cost to go in the dynamic programming and compute the optimal policy and the value function according to uh, the expectation. So there's nothing complicated going on here. OK. So with this, uh, let's get to the news vendor problem, which is a very simple two-stage problem. And it shows you how to apply this dynamic programming methodology to a dynamic optimization problem. And the news vendor problem is as follows. The news vendor problem is as follows. So I don't know how many of you have sold newspapers in your high school, but uh, uh, the idea there is as follows. In the morning, you will collect a lot of newspapers, maybe 100 newspapers. And then you will sit on a train station or a bus stand or whatever. And you will start selling newspapers throughout the day. Now at the end of the day, if only 25 customers came, you now have 75 newspapers. And nobody is going to buy that newspaper in the next day. So the product or the goods that you are selling perishes by the end of the day. OK? So what are other perishable goods like this, which has an expiry date? So food items have expiry dates. Medicines have expiry dates. News has expiry date. So this is a problem for goods that could expire, OK? Goods that become useless after a certain point of time. And the idea is as follows. So you get x newspapers on, on time t equals to 0, sell omega newspapers at t equals to 1. And by default, if you sell omega, then there is some leftover, or there may not be leftover. So if you sold all 100 newspapers, and there are 20 more customers coming to your stand, you now have a regret that if you had bought 100 newspaper, 120 newspapers, you would have earned more money. But anyways, you will sell, get newspapers on time 0, sell w omega at time t equals to 1. And I want to minimize the negative of profit. And I'm going to take the expectation. And this minimization is over x, and it's over what else? Oh, OK. So sell omega, and then you can also return, return the remaining, if there are any. Uh, so that would be uh, y of omega. So this is minimization over x and y of omega. Where x is the number of newspapers you bought, y of omega is the number of newspapers you returned to the publishing agency. So typically, publishing agency would use the, would, would take back the unsold newspapers, because then they could use the paper for, uh, recycle the paper in order to uh, make the newspaper for the next day. So this is the news vendor problem. This is a two-stage dynamic programming problem. And we are going to solve this dynamic programming problem in the next class on Monday. Have a good weekend. And those of you who are taking off for Thanksgiving, I'm angry at you guys. <laughs>